Cool. So thank you all so much for coming along today to spend some time finding out a bit more about what's happening with this iOS 14 update. Um, we, me and the team have spent the last, I guess, since the kind of big announcements hit in December, we've spent the last kind of month and a half consuming all the knowledge we can, um, reading blog articles, listening to podcasts. I've probably listened to about eight podcast episodes on this topic alone from some of my favorite people. Um, we don't know everything and no one really knows exactly how this is going to play out, including Facebook themselves. Um, we'll try our best to answer all the questions that you guys have at the end of the session today. If there's questions unanswered, we will put them through to our rep at Facebook and note them. They may well be questions we've already put to our rep. So we've put, put some quite um, sort of technical detailed questions to our rep and he didn't know the answer to any of them. Um, we even have um, a former Facebook employee who's just joined us um, last week and he didn't necessarily have all the answers. But please be, be assured that we are seeking the information and we will be um, kind of um, finding out from all of the best sources information as we find it. Um, but I'll do my best now today to summarize to you kind of what we know so far and what we think you guys need to do about it and what we will be doing about it um, in terms of our optimization processes, in terms of making sure you have everything um, set up as it should be in order to continue to have great results from your Facebook ad marketing as this continues to roll out throughout the year. So without further ado, so what exactly is happening? So the basic summary of what's going to happen is Apple will start to prompt users on whether they're willing to allow apps to track their personal usage of the app via their ATT framework app tracking transparency. So that's going to happen. Now, when is that going to roll out? Um, sorry, oh, I'll talk, tell you when in a second, but it's basically going to roll out in the spring. So that's when it's expected to happen. It was going to happen in January, but Apple have kind of bowed to pressure, I think, from Facebook and pushed it back towards the spring. So you may see on Facebook groups or online people mentioning that they're being prompted about this. We think Apple's rolling it out to some people. Facebook's doing some testing with certain pockets of people. So that's where you will see rumblings of people talking about it happening already. But it's not officially rolling out as far as we understand it until spring. And that's from many different sources that I've, I've got that information. So, so that's what's happening. In terms of what it will look like, so um, Tim Cook from Apple tweeted this tweet, which has had um, kind of a huge amount of people resharing it and discussing it. Um, the way Apple are positioning this is that they are positioning it as a choice issue. So they're positioning it as we, we want to be the phone that gives users control over their data. We could debate for hours about Apple's real reasons for doing this, about the fact that there's kind of definitely a kind of jockeying for power between um, Facebook that, you, that kind of harnesses all users' data to make a lot of money, and Apple who doesn't currently have... Um, much opportunity to monetize the data from its users so therefore is using this as a way to kind of wage war with Facebook um, but Facebook will have Facebook and other apps that are also iOS apps will um, have the opportunity to kind of edit this little bit of text in this screen here where they will that will be where they will be trying to um, persuade users to allow tra allow um, tracking we expect, and like a lot of people are kind of, you know, there's a lot of guessing going on. We probably expect maybe a quarter to a third of people to continue to allow tracking and the rest will probably say no. That's what we're kind of expecting. It remains to be seen. Charlie and our team um, commented today that European users um, are much more used to like seeing the cookie prompt and just crossing out and, and accepting it. We're much more used to opting in for things for GDPR all the time without really thinking about it. So potentially people in Europe might be more likely to click allow. That's one theory, maybe not. So we just don't really know. Um, Facebook is definitely very worried about it. You, many of you would have seen this message in your, um, in your Facebook ad manager being prompted. This came up kind of around December time. People started seeing this around. Um, Facebook is certainly making a very loud noise about the big impact this will have and they're using small bit the impact on small business as a bit of a kind of trump card to kind of get more PR and to to get the people that they want to listen to listen. Um, 
interesting fact facebook spent one billion dollars on its pr campaign to get this stopped or rolled back or to have an impact on apple or to get people to pay attention they took out you know full page adverts in the newspaper um they've spent a significant amount of money on their own platform advertising um so it's interesting just to know that how much money they're spending on the kind of pr campaign around this um you can be assured that they're spending similar amounts of money on internal resource at Facebook to figure out workarounds. So their whole advertise, their whole business model rests on their advertising working really well. So I feel fairly confident that they'll find some pretty interesting workarounds soon. But as it stands, um, I think they're pretty worried about the immediate impact and how it's going to impact things. Um, it's interesting to note that their share price hasn't really been impacted by the information. So I think that gives some comfort that the those, you know, people that know about this stuff. I'm sorry, I've just heard someone at the door. But worst honey ever. Just hold hold fire. Hiya. I'll just be two seconds, guys. Sorry about that. Um, cool. So yeah, the Facebook um, share price hasn't been impacted much. So it makes you think that the, the people that study these things very closely aren't too worried about how this will impact Facebook's revenue. And therefore, the kind of you can take the leap from that, that the revenue that comes from advertising, that the advertising is going to continue to be a quality product. So in a nutshell, how worried are we about this? I'm a little bit worried that it's going to impact results in the short term. I'm not too worried in the long term about how this will um, impact overall Facebook's ability to, to drive quality advertising for good quality advertisers. Um, I think we talked about this already when this is expected to kick in, the impact, we think the impact will kick in for a large number of Apple users um, in spring 2021, as I said. How much will it impact? How quickly will it impact? Um, a, a guy called Deepesh Mandalia, who I follow, who's a real expert in this space, he's done quite a lot of research and he's looked at like how long the iOS updates usually take to roll out across the population of iPhone users. And he's estimated that 80% of iOS users will be on iOS 14 by the end of the year with an estimated 43% of total Facebook traffic being on iOS devices. Now, bear in mind, this will vary depending on your own traffic, your, the profile of your users. It would be worth jumping into Google Analytics, and we'll be looking at this for you guys as well, and having a look at what percentage of your users are, are accessing your website from iOS devices. Um, you can check that in the... Um, we can send a link to how to do this, but in the, I think it's in the um, behavior, the behavior section of Google Analytics, there's an option to see what device people are accessing and what, what um, operating system they're accessing your site from. So you can see how much you vary from that 43%. Um, and then, as I said, they expect two thirds to three quarters of people to opt out of tracking. So the whole, you know, the long and the short of that is, people think that 60% of data is expected to be impacted in some way or other, um, but uh, it does remain to be seen. And all of this, you know, it's all extrapolation. We don't really know how people are gonna respond, how quickly they're gonna update. Um, so we just have to watch and see what happens and see what happens to the data. Right, so what does this mean in real terms for our Facebook advertising? So first and foremost, data will start to be less accurate and it will now be aggregated and delayed. So we're already seeing less accurate data on the platform and we're also seeing a lot of people in, um, in the industry that I talk to and hear about talking about much, much less accurate data. So that's where people have access to real data of like how many conversions on a lead form that they're actually getting in the back end versus how much Facebook is reporting. Um, Molly Pittman, who's a big person I follow, she's reporting 30% inaccuracy now between the data shown by Facebook 
and the data being shown um, in her the, the real data that she's accessing. Now, maybe this will calm down a little bit. Facebook's had to update a lot of their systems because they're already rolling out changes. Um, the other thing, the other impact is total loss of 28 day click through view through attribution. So this has been rolled out already in the sense that now the default on ads manager is now seven day click through click and view through attribution. I think I'll check that whether the view through is one day, it might be one day yep. view and seven day click. Yeah. Um, reported conversions attributed to Facebook will decline. So this is a big one. We will see as this continues to roll out, we will see less sales attributed to Facebook. That is what we expect to see. Now, does that mean that there'll be less sales overall on your site? Not necessarily but the reported conversions will go down. So that's something really worth understanding. Like if you are, t are used to seeing a certain ROAS or a certain CPA, you're gonna see that, go that number go down over time as the data and the ability to track declines. Um, now, one thing that Facebook's rolled, up, rolled out already is Facebook are limiting optimization and reporting to just eight conversion events per domain. So this is really key. This is something you need to act on um, immediately if you haven't already. So you need to um, verify your domain. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, and you need to select your eight conversion events per domain. And those events are like, are, um, you then have the ability to order them in a hierarchy. So your highest, for e-com at least, your highest ranking event will always be purchase. And then you work backwards down the funnel from there. Um, so there'll be only eight allowed per domain. For ecom, this doesn't worry us too much. We think we can work with the eight conversion events. We typically work with like around five or six for the main part of the funnel. And then we might add something like a lead gen um, event as well. Um, now, this is another key point. So for users that opt out of tracking, we will still be able to track one conversion event out of the eight. So if a user... Um, opts out of tracking and then sees an ad and then clicks on it and then buys something from that company, then that purchase, that highest ranking event of the eight that that company is tracking on their domain will be tracked back to the campaign. Um, so that's good news. So we lose a lot of the data and that's why we're gonna lose 60% because all of those other seven events that happened prior to that happening will be gone, but at least we'll have that that will know what that highest funnel event is within our eight that they have converted on. So, um, so that's actually really good news. That means that we're not completely in the dark as to conversions that are happening. We are being given this one conversion, which is great. Um, and the other impact is some, some or total loss of demographic breakdowns for conversions. So it looks like we won't have the gender and age breakdown that we used to have about your conversions. So you would have to look at other ways to get that kind of data um, about who's buying from you. So post-purchase attribution surveys are a great way of doing that, asking people um, after they buy from you if they can tell you a little bit more about them so that you still learn about your customer base and who wants to buy from you. Um, so those are the main impacts. Um, in terms of marketing, how does this actually impact our campaigns and the success of our campaigns? The first thing that it's going to impact is retargeting audiences will be depleted. So because we um, the attribution window will be, sorry, no, it's not because of the attribution. Because of um, the fact that a lot of people will be opting out of tracking, we therefore won't be able to retarget them at all. So people who are opted out of tracking, in theory, we won't be able to retarget them. So even though we'd be able to track if they converted within seven days, we wouldn't be able to show them ads until that point that they convert. So that's a huge big thing that's going to happen. This is going to impact mostly, it's going to be more difficult and impactful for brands that have a long purchase cycle. So large purchases, high consideration purchases like a sofa or a holiday or um, something expensive that you might spend time thinking about where you would need a lot of retargeting to make that purchase happen. That's going to be trickier for those types of brands. And we're going to talk in a little minute about what you can do to kind of mitigate that impact. The second marketing impact is actual tracked conversions will be decreased. So as I said earlier, um, although we'll have that one conversion event, we won't be tracking all of those other events leading up to it. And so we will see that number go down. The third impact is that audience quality 
will be decreased. Now, this is a big one. So up until now, we've had this amazing ability from Facebook for Facebook to use a ton of data that it's got both on its platform and off its platform about what people what people's behavior is that therefore gives signals of intent for what they're interested in buying at the moment. So for instance, if you start looking at a bunch of fridges, Facebook knows that you're in the market for fridges and it's gonna show you not just the retargeting ads from the fridge companies that you just visited, but also show you other fridge company ads. Have you noticed that? You start looking for um, a kettle and you start seeing all sorts of kind of kitchen products advertised to you. Now, Facebook is gonna lose the ability to do this with such granularity and such cleverness. And the power of Facebook's advertising in the last few years has been huge broad audiences and then Facebook behind the scenes using its algorithm and all these data points to find audiences that are most likely to purchase what you're advertising. This is going to be decreased. Um, and so we do expect to see that the actual performance could drop somewhat while Facebook kind of figures out workarounds for how to figure out who's going to be most likely to buy. So we do expect, as well as the tracking being impacted, we expect the quality of performance of your ads to also decrease. Um, the other thing that's worth knowing as well as the value of the purchases won't re be reported. So how much people actually spent, the conversion value, that reporting will go away for those people that have opted out of tracking. So we'll see the conversion event, but we won't see how much they spent. Um, this is somewhat annoying but we can use kind of proxy data and figure out, um, you know, we can figure out what your ROAS is in different ways. Um, and I think that, you know, it was only in the last few years that we've been able to report on this anyway. So in many ways, this is kind of going back to rewinding a little bit back to a few years ago when Facebook ads were just didn't have the same power that they have now to, um, to, report on and also optimize the campaigns and hey advertisers survived great back then had great performance you know had growing businesses it was all fine so I will say yeah the value of the purchase is not being reported is kind of annoying and it will kind of have some impacts on our ability to optimize for value but we're not we're not kind of you know we're not too worried about that um, certainly one thing to bear in mind is top of funnel campaigns will definitely appear less effective um, what used to happen is, you know, having a 28 day attribution window would allow us to over the course of a month, attribute back a sale to a top of funnel purchase that didn't happen immediately. Uh, sorry, a top of funnel ad where the purchase didn't happen immediately. Now when that seven day window closes, we won't be able to see whether that ad drove a purchase, whereas we would have seen that before. So Top of, expect your top of funnel campaigns to look like they're not working as well, but they could still be driving conversions that fall outside of that seven day window. So that's something really important to bear in mind. Um, quick one on what has happened already. So Facebook has already rolled out the seven day attribution default. So that's what we're now optimizing for in the team. Um, Facebook has started alerting users of the platform, sorry, um, advertisers on the platform, that they will soon require domain verification to advertise. Um, so we've put out lots of notices to you guys, letting you know that you need to verify your domain. If you haven't done it already, then please, please do. At this point, uh, we still seem to be able to advertise without domain, domain verification, but that ability could, could be switched off and pulled out, you know, fairly soon. And then once you've verified your domain, the next very important step is getting your eight events selected and prioritized in Business Manager. If you haven't done this already, please let us know. This is super important. We need to select them and prioritize them as we want them to be. We've got an email that we can send out to you after this meeting um, with a Google Doc with step-by-step step -step instructions and a video showing you how you can do this. Um, really important that you select your eight events. And if you've got special um, tracking events that you use, you know, if you're a subscription business and you've got a different event you use to, to track a subscription versus a purchase, or if you're tracking um, email signups or other things that are important for your particular business, we need to make sure we decide where to prioritize them in that hierarchy. So that's really important. Um, technical solutions and preparation. So, oh yeah, so I've covered this oh yeah and the, then the third technical solution that Shopify uh, and I think WooCommerce um, websites have in there um, available to them now is installing the server-side tracking so 
Um, in the example of Shopify, Shopify have already created um, a system that's easy to set up that automatically sets up conversion API tracking. Um, and this is designed to help advertisers collect data through their website without relying on cookies. And we see this as being something that's going to develop more and more as the kind of as we move towards a cookie-less world, where um, server-side tracking will become more and more of a um, a default, really, for tracking um, conversions. So those of you that aren't on um, a kind of mainstream e-commerce platform like um, WooCommerce or Shopify, you may have to look at building something bespoke here, or um, yeah, there's potential other solutions that you could look at. But um, Definitely talk to us if you want more information about setting this up. We actually asked most, we asked all clients, I think, to set this up several months back. Um, and most of you should have it set up. So um, that's something that will definitely help in this situation. What about Google? I hear you guys all ask. So the short answer is we don't really know yet. Google have been extremely quiet on this, fr on this front. They've taken the opposite approach to Facebook and been very quiet. Um, Google doesn't use the IDFA tracking protocol and from a podcast I listened to this morning we understand that that is kind of the important thing that, um, that, that that's the important difference. Um, so my understanding at this point in time and I'll be honest and say that I'm still kind of researching this area is that they will not require users to opt in to be tracked in order to track conversions from Google search and um, other Google platforms like YouTube. So we'll watch the space, we'll keep you informed of this as we kind of find out more from Google. But the word on the street is that Google are looking, sitting pretty pretty and looking quite pleased with themselves at the moment. So um, it may well be that this issue doesn't impact them as much. I don't, that seems strange to me because if users don't wanna be tracked, they don't wanna be tracked wherever they are. So it will be interesting to see how this unfolds. Um, as things kind of roll out. So watch the space and we'll keep you informed on the Google front. And if you hear anything else, otherwise send the information my way. I'm always looking for more information on the topic. Um, so how will this impact Webtopia and what we're doing for you with your campaigns? So we're already looking at ways and having discussions internally and trainings on how we'll optimize differently and adjust our strategy as the available data changes. Um, we will be looking for spotting trends and performance across our clients. We have the benefit of having all of you lovely clients and we can look at your different accounts and see what's, what trends we're spotting. Um, and we'll of course be like networking with other colleagues in the space to see how they're, they're looking at things. Um, one of the things we're doing at the moment is analyzing the ratio between a seven day and a 28 day attribution so that we can understand how um, the new world we're reporting in um, will play out when a 28 day, if a 28 day attribution was still allowed. So we'd look at like, what's the ratio between a seven day in, in the past world before they switched this off? What was the ratio between a seven day um, ROAS and a 28 day ROAS? And then we can project and use that information to, to try and hit your KPIs in this new world of only having seven days of data. Um, I think we're going to probably move for many clients, especially clients with higher, um, with longer consideration windows and um, higher, higher ticket items. We'll probably move to reporting on blended numbers. So looking at your overall marketing spend and then your overall sales on the site and looking at that as a KPI. So your effective cost per acquisition and your effective ROAS and looking at how that is trending over time and get using that data to feed back into our campaigns to understand whether they're effective. So instead of making like very micro decisions like we used to based on one, two or three days of data just within Ads Manager, we're gonna look at the bigger picture and look at how the campaign's performing overall before we make kind of quick decisions about turning off this ad set or that ad set. Um, so we're working on it and we'll be figuring out ways to optimize effectively for you guys. Another thing that we recommend is allocating more budget towards lead gen to grow your lists. Um, so one of the big things that's gonna happen with, um, with this, as I mentioned, is that retargeting won't be as available to us as a tool to, um, to close the sale and to convince people to come back and purchase. So we recommend doing allocating some of your budget towards actually proactively capturing leads. So you can do this by using some kind of offer like a free postage offer, 
some kind of gift with purchase offer or a competition or um, some kind of extra something that makes people want to give you their email. You can have that on a landing page and we can have a portion of your campaign dedicated towards growing your email list. And then if you guys have set up or we help you set up email sequences that then kind of welcome people to your brand and turn them into from kind of casual visitors into buyers from that email address, that's another way for you to um, slowly build a relationship with a customer that's not an impulse buyer. Um, so certainly discuss that with your campaign manager if you want to start looking at how you can allocate more budget towards lead gen if you're not already. Um, and then another solution that we're looking at with um, internally with the team is ways we can pass UTM. So that's the kind of tracking information that we already put on the end of your, um, your destination links. Ways we can pass UTM information potentially to a cookie and then um, have this information kind of follow the user around when they finally check out and then potentially make that available in your reporting. This is something that I discussed with Philip yesterday. Um, he's very technical on this front and he's got some ideas around it. So watch this space. Um, I think there'll be lots of other um, businesses and people coming up with solutions like this. Um, but certainly we'll be um, analyzing the way we're using UTMs and making sure we're making the best use of UTMs so that we can pass information into your Google Analytics um, and use that information as another source of, you know, optimization um, data for us. Um, what can you do about this? So, you know, this is a big change. This is as big, if not bigger than when GDPR came along in my view. So what can you do about it? How can you prepare your business? I think it's certainly a wake up call. If you're too reliant on one particular channel, i.e. Facebook, then you need to probably address that. Um, explore new traffic opportunities, SEO, content marketing, podcast advertising, PR, YouTube, Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, there's a ton of options, right? So in terms of your top of funnel, bringing people to your website, there's lots of other ways you can bring, bring traf traffic in. And I've always been a big proponent of exploring those options. We have a great um, SEO agency um, that we recommend if anyone needs to talk to him. Um, and we also, this is not a sales pitch, but we also do do YouTube and Pinterest advertising if you want to explore those. Pinterest will be affected in a similar way to this. YouTube potentially not so much, so something to think about. Um, we'd really encourage you to use this as an opportunity to take a look at your kind of back-end marketing and, and really like assess, are you doing all you can? How can you improve your average order value, for instance? How can you improve your customer lifetime value so that if it does happen that your acquiring of customers becomes more expensive because it becomes slightly less effective that you are acquiring customers who stay around for longer who have a higher lifetime value or have a higher average order value when they purchase from you and I'll, I'll go through a couple of ideas for this in a minute suffice to say these are great things to do in your business anyway these are great things to think about so let's use this as an excuse to kind of really get sorted I think this update will really sort the wheat from the chaff the businesses that really invest in the long term, invest in thinking about these things. And also the agencies that do will be the ones that stick around, the ones that just relied on the easiest marketing channel um, and the, you know, the simplest setup probably won't stick around. Um, as I said, you know, one of our suggestions is to grow your email list through lead gen campaigns. The other part of this is be more aggressive about data collection on your site. If you're being quite subtle and it's just in your in your footer, I would strongly encourage you to have a much more proactive overlay on your site collecting email data. Remember, you're going to lose a ton of the ability to retarget. If you can grab people's email addresses, you should be getting five to 10% of people opting into your email when they first visit your site. Then you can use email to build a relationship in the way that retargeting would have before. Um, and then the other thing is improve your email automation as much as you can. We sent around a checklist a few weeks ago of things you should make sure you have in place for your email automation. But it's a fantastic way to turn your casual visitors into raving fans who buy on repeat. And literally, it's while you sleep. You, you know, I know most of you are doing newsletters with some regularity or not so regular. Email automation, you set it up once and then you optimize it a little bit and you A-B test it to get it right, but it works on automatic. And that's the great thing about it. So if you aren't doing this and focusing on this, then I would encourage you to. 
We at Webtopia are adding a service where we will set up um, and optimize your Clavio email automation for you. So talk to me if you want to talk to talk about this. We're also putting together a like mini course. So if you are more of the DIY um, style business, you can do it for yourself and just follow our blueprint of how you how you should do it. Um, so talk to me about either of those options. This is a great chance in the next couple of months to get everything sorted out. It will help your business no matter what happens. So I really encourage you to do that. So here's an example of a much more aggressive email capture. And this, the key thing here, I've tested out a few of your um, email signups and many of you I've noticed do not have a welcome series. Someone's visited your site for the first time, they don't know you, capture the email address and then have a series of emails some people call it a buy or die sequence that introduces your brand, why they should buy from you, all of your wonderful product details, what's great about your product, um, and then potentially into enter them into a discount or offer ladder if they don't purchase immediately. Um, but, but really important to have that. Um, people expect to have some kind of email welcoming them once they sign up. So go ahead and do that. Um, Here's the checklist we sent around. Um, let me know if you, you want to chat about this or you want us to do an audit for you or help you set any of these up. We highly, highly recommend the Clavio platform. I'm not in any way um, a partner of them or any, I don't have any vested interest. I just know from um, colleagues in the industry that I follow very closely that this really is the best in class email platform for e -com and it syncs so beautifully with Shopify. Um, and it makes things really, really easy. So um, I highly recommend Clavio if you haven't explored it already. Um, and then this is a great checklist to work through to make sure you've got it set up properly. Um, the other thing you can do for making your average order value increase is pre and post purchase upsells. Again, with Shopify, super easy to implement some of these apps. This one is um, Zipify from, Zip from Zipify pages. Um, I think it's called, I think it's just called Zipify pre and post purchase upsell app or something like that. But um, on average, this will add, I think it's something like five to 10% extra revenue to your site, just adding this. So again, if you want to chat to us about helping you to increase the average order value, um, we're looking at adding this as a service in the agency, but we also just have recommendations for you that we'll give you for free. So um, come and talk to me about this. Um, expert level solutions to explore. These are pretty kind of high-end technical but I just thought I'd put them up here and I'll share this presentation with everyone so setting up first tracking first party tracking for Facebook is a good idea and then installing server-side tag management and to be honest these are slightly beyond my technical understanding but I wanted to put them in here as um as things to explore for those of you who are kind of more technically minded and want to really dig into this so that is it from me does anyone have any questions? Hey, Jesse, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, just a few, some, a few things I'd like to clarify. Um, so it seems to me clear why um, you need to gather email addresses for, your, for anything that's at the bottom of the funnel. Um, and, that, and, if, and if your bottom of funnel advertising already relies on email gathering, then then that should be fine because you've always relied on emails as well. Um, I can see how absolutely this will hit um, middle of funnel. So we define that as, um, as, as you know, as, as people that have interacted with our ads or our website, but not signed up. Now that clearly, I can see how that potentially is hemorrhaging names and users. So if, if you're very reliant middle of funnel, you need to think about how you address that. Yeah. I'm still not completely clear about how this impacts top of funnel. I can see how in the short term, you have to um, adjust the way you measure things ultimately and the windows in which you do it. Um, and as you suggested as well, potentially introduce sort of more kind of blended measurement or look at your back end and do it that way. Um, how else do you think it will affect top of funnel? Do you, do you just think that over time, generally, Facebook becomes dumber at working out people that look like your customers and look like audiences or allows you to target or whatever? I mean, and, and I guess, what we're all hoping and assuming is they're Facebook. They're just going to get smarter at doing it some other sort of ways. Yeah. Or some data from what, um, but is that broadly right? Yeah. In so terms it's, two, of it's, it's my understanding is it's two things. So one is that yeah, potentially the quality of those um, of those top of funnel audiences will degrade because Facebook's not as good at knowing who wants to 
basically who wants who has the intent to do your 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 action your conversion and it's not able to in real time use the data as like it doesn't have as much real time data on like okay people like jenny keep keep doing this action so i'll find more jennies um so that's one side of it like the facebook becoming dumber as you put it is quite a good <laughs> description and then the second thing is i guess it's more around that top of funnel audiences will look less effective because top of funnel audiences typically take longer to convert. And now we're looking at a seven day window. So we won't be able to say, look back at our top of funnel audiences 28 for 28 days backwards and say, okay, you know, top of funnels converting it like a, a CPA of X. The CPA will look more expensive because we're only able to look back by seven days. So, so it's, it's the quality, but also like the, just the data that we'll see from top of funnel. Um, will be degraded and then those two things will kind of muddle each other and that's the other problem so yeah Understood. and i guess we, we've sort of got to hope that facebook will doing will be doing something to offset that because their entire business model the, the one of the question i had is um regarding uh, email automation um you mentioned clavio have you had any experience with um active campaign um because yeah, we're, we're kind of weighing up the options yeah i mean active campaign has a really great reputation in the industry and probably it's a bit more of a um like multi-purpose like people use it in b2b as well for like you know complex kind of funnels for you know coaches and um course creators that kind of thing whereas clavio is built specifically for product-based e-com and like slots into the back of Shopify. So for you being having your own bespoke site and being kind of a not not exactly e-com but being like SaaS, then you might find active campaign might be a bit more flexible for you. Um, because I don't know how how you would, and this is just I don't know because I'm not sort of technical on this front. I don't know how Clavio would talk to you'd probably have to like build APIs to talk to your back end, whereas maybe active campaign you could set up rules based on your database a little bit more easily. But again, I'm just talking kind of off the top of my head, really. Cool. Thanks. Really useful presentation. Thanks, Jesse. Cool. No worries. Anyone else got questions? I answered all of them. Wow. <laughs> well, by all means, if you're feeling shy today, like reach out to me, Maureen, or or your campaign manager if you've got further questions or worries about this. Um, and also can't emphasize enough how important it is to select those eight events and if you need help with that again reach out to your campaign manager and we can send you the instructions but I will send the instructions to everyone on this call so you guys have it um, and really it's a case of watch the space and we will just keep um, keep doing our best to stay really informed and give you the best possible optimization we can in the circumstances cool thanks everyone see you all soon thank you Jesse. thanks, thanks Jesse. bye, bye. Bye.